I'm Karen Provenza from Napa Book Mine, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight with all of you. Before we get started, I want to go over a few things. Please keep yourself on mute until the question and answer portion of our time together. You're welcome to unmute then and ask your question yourself, or you can put your question in the chat, or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you from there. And I know we're all uh, over experienced with Zoom this late in the game, but just a couple of reminders. If you wanna lose the Brady Bunch look, you can pull the little icon down on the side and put yourself on speaker view. That will help you. We love seeing your faces. Uh, feel free to uh, black yours out if you want, but it's fun to see you all here tonight. We're recording tonight's conversation for you to view later and share with your friends. We'll be sending you an email as soon as that is ready for you to view on YouTube. And lastly, I encourage you to check out our other events on our website and to follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook, and consider supporting our author tonight by purchasing his book from us the, at Bookmine or online. There'll be a link in chat later tonight. So let me let in uh, some late arrivals and we'll start again. All right. Trish, it looks like you, let me ask you, to, for some reason, Trish is in the middle. What's going on with that? Okay, hang on a second. I'll get, how's everyone doing while they wait for me? Let's see, sorry for the delay. Uh, okay, Eddie, I probably just muted you. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Eddie. And we're gonna go back on speaker view. And here we go. I'm still, in, still, still seeing Trish in the middle and I'm trying to get rid of that. Is that everyone's view or just mine? I, I don't have, I, I haven't, okay. I haven't out though. Okay, here we go. Good evening and welcome. It's so wonderful to see you all tonight. I'm Karen Provenza from Napa Bookmine, and I'm thrilled to be here for yet another very timely conversation. One that I hope will encourage all of us to jump in and start entertaining at home. Please say hello to author Eddie Heinz. His book is jam packed with advice on how there he is on how to up your hospitality game. It's called Making Welcome, Enriching Life and Business with Hospitality, a word that is mined for all its deeper meaning in this helpful guide. Here's a bit more about our author. He was born in the Midwest. Eddie Hines set his sights on spending his career in the great outdoors as a forest ranger. By the time he had secured his bachelor's degree in biology, his path had transitioned from outdoor endeavors to indoor ones. Working as a bartender for a few semesters, he found a new calling, hospitality. Arriving in San Francisco in 1985, he established himself in the city's restaurants as an effective fly by the seat of your pants manager. His we can figure this out attitude helped to make a, made him a valuable team member in top restaurants and wineries, including Postrio, Boulevard, Starlight Room, Florio, the Four Seasons on the Big Island, here in wine country at the Francis Ford Coppola Winery in Geyserville. And he is currently applying his innovative ideas in the Napa Valley. You'll hear more about that in a moment. This book is about connectedness, something after two long years of forced separateness, we need more than ever. Making Welcome will help us relaunch thoughtfully. It'll gently guide us towards more meaningful and satisfying experiences, both at home and out in the world. I love what Annie Stoll of the Delfino Restaurant Group said about Making Welcome. This is a deeply spiritual book and may even change the way you live your life. I felt that way reading it. And before you launch into the specifics about how we get this done, uh, tell us more 
about you and how you landed here in the Napa Valley uh, and at this moment in your life. Well, as many of you know, I grew up in, in the Midwest in Iowa, a great place to, to grow up, you know, especially in the time that, you know, we didn't have to lock our cars up. We just dropped the bicycle in the front yard in the morning. It was, you know, and, and uh, pick it up in, or at evening rather and pick it up in the morning to, uh, to go on and have fun, right? So I was raised in a very, you could say, easy environment to be able to learn to trust and connect with people. Uh, and at least in our community, I never felt that people were judging you too much. It was just about everybody's kind of doing their own thing. So eventually, um, I had this opportunity to move up to the West Coast. Uh, I came out to visit at first, decided just to stay and went back and put things into three piles, get rid of it, pack it and, you know, store it and uh, ended up in Southern California. Southern California wasn't really my thing. So I explored Northern California and just fell in love with the Bay Area, specifically San Francisco early on. Uh, San Francisco went through a lot of changes in the, what, two decades I was there. And towards the end was the first dot com. And it was, I was kind of thinking, you know, I need to, I need a little switch up. So I ended up in the Big Island for a little while. Um, and that was a huge turning point for me. Uh, the spirituality, the, the love, the spirit of aloha, really drew me in. Uh, I thought I would never leave. And uh, I decided that eventually, uh, the, everything that I learned, everything that I needed to know about, that I loved about the Big Island or Hawaii in general, I could take with me anywhere I went. So I tried to come back to San Francisco. That didn't work out so good. It's hard to go from, from waking up in the morning to parakeets and uh, you're going outside and gra grabbing a mango for your breakfast uh, to living uh, with a lot of ambient noise and and uh, no green grass. So uh, I ended up in Napa, which is kind of the, the, the good balance between them. We have lots of uh, rolling hills to look at every day and a little calmer uh, demeanor. So uh, I love it here. I, I moved here in 2004 and never really left. Why was it important to you to share all of what you gathered uh, through your years in the service industry, the hospitality industry? What made you, what was the flip that you decided, I got to put this down, I got to well, write it down. The selfish motive was, it's been running around in my head for so long, I had to get it out of my head, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so all of these ideas, it's like, well, this ties into this and this ties into that. And I just really just needed to get it laid out. I, I didn't set out to really write a book. Uh, then once I started thinking about the different categories, I'm like, well, these are chapters in a book. Yeah. So, uh, but the bigger picture motivation for me besides that was that I have seen in the 30 years or so that in the last 30 years, uh, decline of one-on-one -on -one connectedness, not just in our industry, but in, in, in general, uh, going into banks, uh, going, you know, you're the person that you get insurance from. Uh, whatever it is, it seems that we're removing that forward facing person or that feeling of connectedness, like, uh, oh, something's up with my insurance, I'll go talk to Barb or I'll go talk to Frank. Right. Uh, and also in, in restaurants with the maitre d', the, we've replaced these, these beautiful seasoned men and women with, uh, you know, young people who are trying to do a great job, but it's a lily pad for them. It's yeah. not, they don't want to be a host. That's not their career. They're just doing it to get it because it's convenient. It's good money. It's not, it's difficult, but you know, it's doable. So what we're, what we're, in my opinion, what we're losing is a lot. And so this was uh, personally my attempt to try to regain a little bit of awareness on what it could be. Let's begin where you do, where um, you break down the root meaning of the word. And I stumbled a moment, uh, whether it was hospitality or customer service. So also explain mm -hmm. what you do in the book about how those are slightly different. Well, we're the same. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm stealing from Danny Meyer a little bit. Danny Meyer's a, a, a restaurateur out of New York. And I remember he wrote a book called Setting the Table. And I remember reading it going, oh, 
This is it. He put it into words. This is it. Something that none of the rest of us had ever done before. So for me, service versus hospitality. Service is what happens you know, to you, with you. Hospitality is how you feel about it. So the hospitality piece of it, like you can, you can get service from a, from a vending machine, right? So, and when it doesn't, vending machine doesn't work, it says out of service, right? Or out of order. But with the hospitality piece, like do you, can you get hospitality from a vending machine? Well, it depends on, on how you want to look at it. But when you, but most people, if you're like myself, let me not say most people, let's say for me, oftentimes when I choose where I want to go for the evening, it's not about the food or the ambiance. It's about who do I want to go see tonight? Do I want to go see, you know, Bettina at Angel? Do I want to go see Annie and Craig at Delfina? Do I want to go see, you know, who, who is it I feel like seeing tonight as well as what, what we want to have to eat? Because it's, for me, it's always been about connecting with the individuals and the businesses, you know, spending basically voting with your dollar mm -hmm. uh, do you want to spend your money on conveniences or do you want to spend your money on people or with people that you believe in and that you have a connection with so i hope that explained a little bit of it it does um why don't you take us to the five core emotional skills from there of the essential skills for great hospitality should we both turn our, open let's, our book? <laughs> allow, allow me to use a reference. What, what page is that on? <laughs> 15, page 15. All right, thank bookmarks you Bookmarks are coming in handy. <laughs> well, and these are Danny, this is, this is, these aren't my uh, five emotional skills. These are Danny Myers from, from right. Set the Table, right? But I, I love them because it actually starts to define something that is somewhat undefinable. Because if you think about hospitality, a lot of times it's that you should have been there. I can't explain it, right. Thing, right? But then when you, when you start to dial it in, this is kind of what it looks like. Okay, number one is optimistic warmth, genuine kindness, thoughtfulness, and a sense that we will find a way. And what these are, are the five emotional skills that you're looking for in a good hospitalitarian, right? A good a person practicing hospitality. Number two is intelligence, not just smarts, but an insatiable curiosity to learn for the sake of learning. So for me, intelligence is, is it can be from here, mm -hmm. but quite often it's from here as well. It's, a, it's about emotional intelligence, right? Number three is work ethic, a natural tendency to do something as well as it can possibly be done. There's a saying then how you do something is how you do everything. That's the perception that others will have of you. So if you're, if you're one way, that's how people will think you do everything. If you're another way, then, then that's how they're going to think. And for me, that steps into work ethic. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, empathy uh, and awareness of care for and con and connection to how others feel and how your actions make them feel. So now suddenly, remember what we talked about with the uh, with the um, service versus hospitality. Hospitality has to do with how you feel about it, but also it extends into the other person, meaning that you're also noticing how they're feeling about it. It's not about applying you know, a layer onto someone, it's a, ba it's a back and forth. It's a call and response as far mm -hmm. as, as, far as um, when you're connecting with them. Uh, number five, self-awareness and integrity, an understanding of what makes you tick, a natural inclination to be accountable for doing the right thing with honesty and superb judgment. So it equals out to doing your best every single day. Right. That's my phone. Sorry, I forgot to put it on silent. Um, when I started reading this, I started reflecting on my grandmothers, uh, an Italian grandmother and a Jewish grandmother. 
And my Italian was the one who did most of the entertaining of both sides of the family. And uh, gosh, she was an excellent cook, but boy, did she get a lot of this wrong. And it made me wonder about your early childhood experiences, either with your grandparents or your own uh, mom or, or father, whoever was delivering the hospitality in your household. It's, it's not fair to assume it was only the women doing that. Well, especially, especially with my dad, um, Tim's on the, on, on here too, my brother, Tim and, um, my dad, he, my dad, he didn't know what a stranger was. He was one of those guys that would draw you in or josh you or joke you, whether he knew you or not. He had no, he had no fears about connecting with people, even if they didn't want to be connected with, you know? So I won't say to a fault, but if you knew Adrian, you know, you would, you would get that. And my, and my mom was a, a great host. So my memories growing up are of, of those card parties and uh, yeah. dom or dominoes or whatever. And, and I'm going, I'm, and I'm a child upstairs trying to go to sleep and all I hear is laughter and, and, and it was easy to fall asleep to that. It was, it was a joyful uh, time, you know, and and I and I know full well that not everybody had that that same kind of childhood, but this is what kind of sparked that in me. I thought it was that this is how everybody was, and within our extended Heinz family, we have a few other Heinzes on on here as well. Within our extended oh. Heinz family, it went to um, uh, through. My, my dad had two brothers, uh, Sam and Ron, like Ron would like, you couldn't not almost pee your pants whenever he was in the room. The guy was <laughs> funny as heck, you know, he really was. And, and all of them, but you got the three of them together, uh, when we were young kids and it was, it was, uh, a lot, a lot of tears, a lot of, lot out of laughter, you know? And, uh, and, and then my mom was a little bit more subdued, but she had the grace and elegance to put really amazing things together. And so yeah. that, it was, so it, it was a good, like it was a good springboard. Blood. Pardon? It's in your blood to- Yeah, it was a good to, springboard to, to start from. Yeah. I was also intrigued by um, your reliance and the way that you pulled in modern and ancient cultures, as well as philosophers. And I thought it'd be interesting to start with Eckhart Tolle and have you kind of connect the dots to hospitality for us with Edgar. Do you mm. need a page number for that? No, <laughs> no, I'm good on that one. You're good. Um, I guess I, I guess the, the, the best reply is how could I not? Um, when, when, when we're in service to others, as it were, and there's different levels of that, of course, you could be Mother Teresa, and you're in service mm -hmm. to others. Or you can be working as a server in a restaurant and be in service to others. What ends up happening is that everything, nothing exists except for that moment. And when you're when you're fully involved in what's going on, time is it's it either goes really fast or really slow. It, it's it's flexible because the only thing that you're thinking about is what is needed in this moment. What am I, what am I doing right now? And, and come to find out it's actually a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. You know, it was almost, uh, you know, hit myself in the head and going, that's what we do every night. We, we live in that moment. There is no future. There is no past. I'm not worried about my bills. I'm not worried about what I'm going to be doing after work. I'm just fully focused on what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, living in the moment. And then when you, come out of that, i.e. things start to relax and you kind of come out of it, you're charged. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, after a 10 hour shift on the floor, you are exhausted, but you're just, your, your, your heels are you're this flying this high off the ground because you just feel really good. I'm going to go home. I'm going to sleep so well tonight. Cause that was just amazing because everything else had stopped except for what's happening in that moment. It sounds very much like being on stage, but for mm -hmm. those moments it's, it's opening act to closing act and then you you left it all on the stage you're done yeah or or an artist or a carpenter or mm -hmm. an engineer or or a race car driver or you know it's all 
staying in that staying in the zone for an athlete, I guess, is the same thing. It's it's but it's a it's a wonderful place to to be. Obviously, we can't be there at all times, but what we once we've experienced it, we know when we're not experience it, experiencing it anymore. So we can check ourselves and say, hey, listen, I'm not I'm not really in the moment right now. I'm worried about too many other stuff. And it's okay. But you may want to take yourself out of that too. It's up to you. Right. Right. Um, let's take a, a little pause from s stepping through the book and um, share some experience, local experiences. And if it's a good one, tell us the restaurant and the people <laughs> and what made it such a fabulous, hospitable moment. If it's a bad one, just uh, don't mention the names. <laughs> well, I mean, we have, I have um, great, uh, great experiences consistently at Angel, which is yeah. Patina's place here in Napa. Um, I also have great experiences consistently with my favorite little wine bar called Cadet. And it's not that they do anything over the top, like I'm blown away. But when I walk in, oftentimes I'll get caught talking to somebody and they walk over and hand me a beer they know I'm going to enjoy. I didn't ask for it. They just, here you go, Eddie. Here's the Sasan we have on tap today. You know, it's just, a, it's, a, it's just about, again, and you said it before, connectedness, recognition, um, and that's really all it takes. And the cool thing about any of this, I don't care if you're a lawyer, a, a doctor, uh, you work in you work in, um, in banking, it doesn't matter. All of these things are applicable to your business as well as well as as well as your life. You know, saying hello to people when they're coming by. I love walking down hallways of of strange places, just saying hello to people and just watching their reactions. And a lot of people will really light up. Oh, mm -hmm. someone saw me they recognized me they they and other people are kind of like oh because weird he said, he said hello to me and he, I, don't, I don't know who that is so it depends on how people react but that their reaction is up to them it's it's as long as you're as you're putting it out there um in a, in a real good way but there are great hospitality stories um you know happening all the time and that's the that's the great news um the places that to me locally or otherwise don't really um are, are missing the mark a little bit it's because i think their attention is focused on other things uh their attention might be focused on financial or or um uh, what's what's the word i'm looking for uh an image or something other than other than really just taking care of each person in the door uh, there was a saying with the restaurant group that I used to work with is we take care of guests one at a time. Yeah. So I don't, I, I, I know I'm not giving you more specifics, but. You're not dishing the dirt, but that's no. okay. <laughs> Tell, um, you mentioned something that reminded me of another uh, point that I thought needs to be underscored in that the, ho the hospitality begins with how you treat your staff. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Like, cause in personal experiences from when you were front of the house. Yeah, uh, how, how would we expect our, our staff to deliver great hospitality if they weren't receiving it from the management, right? So if I'm walking around being that, and believe me, I'm no saint, right? So if I'm walking around, <laughs> what what I call them, Eddie Cranky Pants. If I'm Eddie <laughs> Cranky Pants on any given day, and I'm just I, I'm coming down on my staff, there's an excellent chance that they're not going to be as 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 great and open and friendly with with their with our guests as they would had I checked myself and 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 um, not done that. So it it begins, you know, the fish stinks at the head. It's a Neapolitan saying uh, that. Uh, uh, Giovanni Scala taught me and it it means that it all that's where it starts it it all starts with us as we're the only I'm only responsible for to the tips of my fingers I'm not responsible for anything else but I am responsible for me yeah I'm going to invite anyone who would like to ask a question to um, just either wave or 
I'm going to put a different view for myself. I still have more, but I, I know that it was important to Eddie and myself that we made this as casual as possible, which means more than the two of us should be talking. No, no format. No format. There he is. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, Joe. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good, good. Hi, Joe. Hey. Hey, Eddie. Hi. I, I just uh, read this the book this past week, and I already wrote you a, a note about it. I was Thank you. surprised about the book. I was looking at, oh, Eddie knows how to do this and that, and I was thinking it's going to be a how-to book, basically. And it's not. It's basically a how-to-be book. Yes. Wow. How to be. Uh, deal with the now, you know, and and uh, Karen, you mentioned the Italian background. I'm 100% from an Italian background. <laughs> Did I, you have a grouchy grandma too, <laughs> Nana? <laughs> we had one grouchy grandma. The other was... <laughs> but, you know, my, my mother especially, my dad too, but she was like the symbol of hospitality. Everybody yeah. who she never met coming to her house, they felt like they were cousins immediately, mm -hmm. cared for, fed for sure, my God. My younger brother was a Jesuit priest and he would call at 10 o'clock and I say, gee, we're on our way back from a meeting. I got six of my buddies with me. Okay, come on in. We'll have dinner ready, you know? And boy, that, uh, you know, she just lit up the room. And yeah. I think it's because she wanted to enjoy every minute that she could. She didn't worry about how she planned it. How am I going to plan for it? If, she was always ready for it with an open heart. And I think so much of that was in the book that, you know, we're running down to that book by tomorrow to buy uh, two or three more because I think it's lessons that some of our teenage grandkids could yeah. learn from. You know, if they put aside the serving in a restaurant or a winery, no. The essence of this is how do you deal in the now? How do you forget about the past? You can't change it, as you said, you know, and work on the now so that your future will be better uh, for everybody. So I think there were so many lessons in there that were reaffirming for me but yet crystallized it in black and white, which I love. Mm -hmm. And this way, maybe I could pass it on to a couple of our grandkids who are teenagers and one turning 21 soon, and then maybe have a dialogue with them about it. How did you feel about that? Do you think that's something you can do or you do do, or you see your parents doing and start to talk about it so that they can live it more and use it more. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I was very impressed and happy to read the book. Thank you, Joe. Hi, Donna. Hi, I just like to say I read the book with such joy and such thanksgiving. I thought it was beautiful. You mentioned the four ingredient four elements in your book, and my 18-year-old, our 18-year-old granddaughter had read it, and so I bought it and read it. And so I was so thrilled when you referenced it in your book. And I'm gonna buy your book for her older brother who is turning 21 this weekend, because he is, he's more spontaneous than she. She is more thoughtful and thinking and, and, and a wonderful, they're both wonderful people, but very different in their approaches. She'll sit and talk about a book. He doesn't typically, but he will if Grammy gives it to him. <laughs> <laughs> the only other power. About doing that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to take up too much time, but I love the part about Tallulah and Ruby because we know them. And we'll knew, tell that. And Since... knew their grandparents, uh, you know, Art Fickelstein and so on. And yeah. our kids had visited there when they were just starting this Be Kind idea. Uh -huh. Our grandkids visit there. And they are such charming, wonderful kids to say, hey, let's get out there. And what's it mean to be kind and to spread that word? I was so glad that you had that reference in there. An mm -hmm. example of Ruby is that we were at a wine tasting and yeah. we had our six-year-old granddaughter with us. Ruby was selling her Girl Scout cookies. So she had her job. She was very busy. But little Brennan goes over and says, can I hold your chickens? <laughs> Hang on a second, I'll take you over there. So she unlocks the cage, she brings Brennan in, lets her pick him up and play with them, interrupts her day, her time, and to be hospitable, to be hospitable <laughs> and kind to this little kid who was feeling lost. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they epitomized. And yeah. I think, you know, every time you see that kind of kindness in the world, you need to turn around and say, this is a wonderful behavior. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, the more we can say thank you around the world, the mm. better it will be. And I, I love your book. I love it. <laughs> it definitely feels very necessary right now. That it does. Yeah. It yeah. does. Thank yeah. you. 
Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. I, I was hoping that Ruby and Tallulah and uh, Judd and uh, would would all join us, but um, unfortunately they couldn't do it. So. Yeah, I have a feeling he's a little busy right now, and I I'm have sure. A he's right. <laughs> I'm sure he has a hospitality plan in place. Yeah. Uh, he knows how to do that. Okay, uh, Jerry. Eddie is the consummate professional. Whether you're at the winery or with him at dinner, he makes you feel that it is all about you. Uh, Patricia and I always feel that he's gone up, gone up and above the call of duty, but perhaps it's just normal for Eddie. That's, um, tell us what you're doing now, because it, it was uh, interesting to me because it's what we're doing now. We're Zooming, but you're doing it with wine, right? <laughs> right. Tell us. I I have, I have the best job in the world. My only task is to make sure that uh, I work at Camus Vineyards, uh, is to make sure that all the guests that come in have a great time and that, uh, that the staff is taken care of. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. And during COVID, uh, we, we did a lot of, of Zoom tastings. What that meant was that people would, that, that couldn't get together, we would ship wine to say a family for a birthday. Everybody was separate, but we, the same the same wines were sent to the same to to the individuals, and then they would all hop on a Zoom, and I would lead them through um, a tasting and tell stories and just talk about things, and and it was great. And and there are several different experiences in that. Uh, some people were super interested in the wine; other people just wanted to talk and have fun. So so we just kind of played it by ear, and if the family just wanted to talk and have the wine I just hung in with them and if they wanted to hear more stories then we did that and so it was it was good it was it was very um it was almost healing in a way to see that people could still be together uh wine shouldn't be that serious it should be it should be fun so it was it was it was nice so are we are we all ready to pivot back and what would be uh, perhaps some baby steps to start entertaining again and, and delivering this hospitality? How do we do it? How do we start? One step at a time. Um, <laughs> well, you, you know, know what? It's reminding me of the story you said of the, the, the person who was welcoming their uncle by creating their favorite dish. You wanna share that and then maybe evolve into answering the question? Or? Well, there was a there was an Easter egg in there, actually. In fact, there's two, there's two Easter eggs in the book. This is, a, this is an insider's Easter egg, and then there's one everybody can have. So that story was designed around uh, some very important people in my early management life. Um, I, I wanted to create a story. The story's made up, right? I, I, I used it as an example, but um, the uncle's name is David. And he uh, is actually, it uh, looks like O'Malley's on this call, David O'Malley, my, my, my great friend. Um, so it was Uncle David. Uh, the restaurant was called Luigi's. Luigi was one of our favorite maitre d's at this restaurant called Bix. And as uh, her husband is deploying the cocktail shaker, they're listening to Bix Beiderbeck, which Bix was nicknamed after. So it was this trio of different things that I, I threw into the, to, to this story to help it help, uh, it was like a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing for me to give it, to make it personal. Yeah. But, the, but the general story has to do with uh, someone stepping outside of their comfort zone, which I guess is the baby steps that we're talking about. It's just stepping a little bit outside your comfort zone, not making the dish that you would normally make that you always hit it out of the park and that people expect that you're gonna make, but try something new, try something different. Uh, I, whenever I have people over, which isn't that often, but when I do, um, I try to make something that I always wanted to try to make. And if I mess up, okay, you know, I'm not going to try to make the perfect dish for people, but I want to try to, I want to try to make it not just about having people over, but also about a, a new experience for myself as, as well as, as well as them. And as my friends that come over will tell you, I'm not the best cook. But you know, Al's, it, but people generally eat it. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're just kind. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions before I continue with mine, or would somebody like to unmute and uh, and share either uh, an experience or some insight from? Okay. I'll just mention one more thing about getting back into action. 
and uh, we have been. Uh, you know, I, I was very busy the past two years volunteering. I, I'm a physician giving shots in St. Helena, getting a lot of people shots and boosted. I felt good about that. But even before that, we had our patio set up with six, eight foot distancing with tables around, and we'd still have people over for a wine tasting. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing it with a bit more regularity. I think Eddie's been over at least to one of them. But, you know, we'll do a blind wine tasting and we'll have a heavy appetizers and just promote a lot of dialogue. And I, it's always fun for me, not that it happened to Eddie, but when I have people in the wine industry, bring a bottle, bring a bottle, and we put them in numbered bottles and do it blind, that about half the time, the people from the winery can't tell their own wine. And the other lay people, like we are, just love that, that there's that vulnerability. You know, we always say the main thing is all I want you to say is it yummy or yucky, and that's the most important. But if you if you know if you know that this is a Syrah versus a Zinfandel or you know versus a Pinot, well, we're going to have fun at the end. You know, when we discover these things, and I think when you get a variety of people in there, then you don't have the wine spa. You know, people who are just feel like they're experts and don't want to deal with it. You have the variety of people who can enjoy it. And that's what wine and food should be all about. It's again, part of my Italian background. Hey, you know, people say, what's your favorite wine? Uh, tell me what I'm eating. I'm you know, eating. I'm eating. <laughs> you, know, you know, just take it, take it down so everybody can enjoy the now again, the now. Right. So it exemplifies Eddie's point in the book and that it's getting people together to be enjoying each other and the now and being in the moment and not somewhere else where their minds are not in an enjoyable state. Mm -hmm. So we, we are uh, continuing to use this reference from Eckhart Tolle. I'd like for you also to bring in um, the time you spent in Hawaii and what you brought to this book from that experience into your hospitality in general from Hawaii. Um, Hawaii, Hawaii was a game changer for me. It, it really was. I wasn't sure why I was going. I guess you could say in a romantic sense that Hawaii called me there and then it spit me out later. Uh, <laughs> but while I was there, I just immersed myself in, in, in the culture because I was fascinated by it. I had already been on a bit of a spiritual journey. Uh, I'd been reading you know, the Tao Te Ching. I've been studying Buddhism. Um, and I also, re I also referenced this, that I, I was also studying Sherlock Holmes um, I think I think that his methods, I don't know how I tie the, all this together, but I have a weird way of linking different things together. But when, when I arrived there, I realized that it Hawaii Hawaii to me, in my mind, being a, from the mainland, was about tropical island, vacation, weddings, you know, newlyweds and nearly deads, as they say, you know, it's it was about that's what it was, but that's not at all what Hawaii is about. It is about the land. It is about the spirituality that's there. If you believe in ley lines, that's it's a very powerful place. And so I, I was able to dive deep into it. I mean, they have words that express feelings and uh, responsibility and uh, care for each other that most languages don't. And so even just the word aloha, it's such a powerful word. Um, so if if you, it's the it's the power of your breath. You know, it's it's my my it literally translates to uh, my breath goes with you. So uh, it's it's just it was just you know I I, I invite you all to to look into uh, Hawaiian spirituality and just see what you can pull from it. And tell us about this Japanese concept of intense <laughs> hospitality. The I want to practice. Omoyari. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right because I've only seen it in words. I, I asked, left that to you. <laughs> I, 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 I've asked Japanese people, you know, tell me about Omoyari. And they go, what? So, but it, yeah, I mean, I'm not American Japanese people. So, so to me, that was the same thing as what I found when I was in in hawaii i wanted to go to japan to to look into it more but i thought yeah well i can do my research the with omoyari you when you're connecting with the other person it's not about you and them there's a third person in the room almost right it's about 
the two of you, two of us as as a collective. So it's like a husband and wife team in a way, right? If, if in, a, in a good marriage where there is an individual here who has individual needs and, and everything, there's an individual here who has individual needs and everything, but as a family, as a familial unit uh, or as a couple, there's a whole other third, almost like a third thing going on there. And so when you're connecting with somebody on a, on a deeper level, that's kind of what happens. There's me, there's you, and then there's us. And that us is the the place that you, when you're when you're really connected with someone that you want to you want to stay in and as much as possible. And the cool thing about it is it's it's taught. Uh, I'm told it's taught uh, in in school. There's a there's actually they conceptualize it um, in school, and it and it lays out in a financial way. Because here in the U.S., we're we're based basically a, as an investor's economy, meaning the business's uh, job is to pay back their investors and everybody become profitable. But um, uh, with Japan, it's uh, what's what's the word I say use in the book? It's about the it's, a, it's <laughs> their, their economy is based on instead of making the investors profitable, making the staff successful. So um, it's a it's an economy that is based on structure and helping each other uh, become successful by elevating the the service industries. And I always see everybody looking at their books, going, "What is that called? What is that called?" Um, Do you but yeah, it's, that? A, it's a it's a different it's a different focus because the saying is, uh, att- "Energy flows where attention goes." Right. So if all we're doing is paying attention to to how we how much money we're going to make, then a lot of other things are going to fall by the side. But if we have our attention focused on each other and helping to elevate each other, then in my experience, in my, you know, humble experience, the rest of it takes care of itself. If you go to any business and you know, and you look around and all the employees are happy, I'm going to almost guarantee you that it's profitable unless they are, unless they are just, wasting money. Let's talk about that unhappy customer. You you said the word happy and it made me think of that unhappy person. And sometimes at BookMine, it's the, you're doing your damnedest to find that book and it's not there. (laughs) And you have to turn that around. We work really hard as you know, to make sure all of our customers get what they want. And, um, and think of us as that, as that place that delivers fabulous customer service. But what, what are the tricks for turning around someone who seems to can't be pleased? The best one is to listen. Listening is always disarming. If, and if you're thinking about what it is you wanna say while they're talking, then you're not really listening. The best thing to do is just listen to what they have to say and then empathize with them as best you can. You know, sometimes people are silly, you know, they're gonna want something that you can't deliver. And you can you can listen to them and you can say, I think I understand what you want. Let me summarize. Is that what you want? Yes. We can't give that to you. I, I apologize, but we can't, we can't do that for you. And then at least you're on an on a even playing field. But if you're interrupting or not listening or then it just elevates into something else. It's you're reminding me again of what our, we hope to pass along to our grandchildren, that part of careful listening and another good lesson that transcends just hospitality in general. Yeah. Yeah. We have a few more minutes. Who wants to ask a question? Or, Can I add on to what I just said? Do you mind? You certainly may. This okay. is your show. Well, okay. But it's our <laughs> show. Um, I'm going to turn the lights on. <laughs> that's all right. And now so <laughs> I just wanted to say that also you have to realize that when, with, with, especially with bookstores and restaurants and stuff, people are coming off the street and you don't know what happened before they got there. Right. So again, the, with the four agreements, you're not taking it personally. And so it's easier to listen if you're not taking it personally, if you're not thinking this guy's a real, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so 
that would be, you know, number one is just realizing this guy came off the street. Anything could have happened before they got there. Uh, so let's give, let's give the guy a break and just listen to what he, what he wants. Yeah. It goes back to empathy where we started, you know, one of the. You guys want to see that Easter egg that I was, I was referring yeah. to earlier. All right. You're not going to be able to see it on the zoom. So you're gonna to have to buy a book and look, look for it yourself. Right. Oh, good. But I if you look question. right up here at the very top of the flame, if you get yourself a magnifying glass, right. And you go yeah. and you, and you look at that. There's a word in there, and it's a word that keeps popping up throughout the throughout the book, and the word is trust. So, it's ultimate, not there. I don't see it. It's well, you get a magnifying glass. It's buried. Right. It's an Easter egg. You're supposed to, you know, you, you have to look. <laughs> um, and it's a word that pops up through the book because ultimately, that's what we all want: is to trust each other, to be trusted. To have the guests or or people come into the retail shop or the restaurant or the whatever and trust that even if you make a mistake, you're going to make it right. That's it. Right. So so that's why you'll you'll see that you'll just see that word just keep showing up and then at the at the end on the last chapter, uh, we kind of uh, you know put put the stamp on it as it were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're this resonated with me deeply. Um, I even started in my notes, this need for a daily ritual of connection. You mentioned it when you said, you know, you go into your places downtown and it's a cheers moment where they, they cry your name, Norm, you're here. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, a wonderful reminder that we need, if we're not getting it, then it's sort of on us to, to initiate it. You know, to have that conversation with the bank teller that you, you want to tell that story or do you want to save it for purchasing the book? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy to tell the story. Uh, it was just one of those weird things. It, 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 and it's, I was basically channeling my dad. Right. My dad, people were people were shy. He would try to coax him out of it a little bit. Yeah. And so I had this bank teller and um, I would go there and I would ask, talk, try to talk to her and she was just being very shy and very, um, you know, here's your money, you know, and, and, and so I would, as I left, I would always say, see you later, alligator, you know, just to lighten things up and to bait her a little bit, I guess. And then, and then at one point in time, maybe after half a dozen of those, um, I, I said, you know, there's, you know, I always say, see you later, alligator. I go, the best answer is after a while, crocodile. And so she, that was our thing. I say, see you later, alligator. She say, after a while, crocodile. And then eventually she left uh, the the that spot, and uh, I, I hadn't seen her forever. And I'm walking up Market Street, and all of a sudden I hear this: "See you later, alligator!" Or after a while, crocodile. I turn around <laughs> and it's her getting on the bus, uh, waving, uh, and that was it. But but it meant something to me, and I'm I'm hoping it did to her too that we had that moment in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a wonderful reminder that we need to start doing that again. I've noticed uh, with masks, you know, that it's, you can tell when people are smiling under their masks. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that is a way to continue connecting when it's hard. And I think we're, we're coming out of a really difficult time. And it's easy to focus on, on the people who are, um, you know, cutting you off in traffic or in line at the grocery store. And mm -hmm. I think we need to empathize now and offer a lot of grace to everyone in our, our world, especially in the service industry, because we're, we're leaning on them hard at the moment, very hard, we are. which makes me wonder what you think about the state in general in of hospitality in Napa right now. And if it's experience the same for tourists as it is for the locals. No, it's it's it, it. Napa has the great luxury of being absolutely drop dead gorgeous, and flying <laughs> people and 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 having it be uh, not only acceptable but almost recommended that people day drink right. So just being in Napa, everybody's got a leg up, 
right? A little buzz on, huh? <laughs> well, and, they, and and they're just happy, right? They're happy to be here, especially on a day like today. It was gorgeous today, right? So we've got we've got a leg up. It's ours to lose, basically, is what I'm saying. Is the stage is set, the setting is there. Uh, to to get down to the root of your question, do I? How do I think we're doing? Not so good. Uh, I think that I think it's not just Napa. I I talk to people uh, from a lot of different markets, and they're saying the same thing. Uh, COVID didn't help. Uh, if anything, it kind of we reverted back to some maybe not so great habits. Um, I'm not gonna put a judgment on good or bad, but nonetheless, there are habits that don't don't help hospitality. Um, and so, so you know, I, I think that this is an opportunity. I think that anytime things uh, slope down a little bit, I think that that's a great, uh, we, we recognize it and we put extra effort into it to get it where we wanna go. Uh, did did COVID cause it? No, it was already heading in that direction anyway. I, I personally think. Can't blame COVID. Are you, the guy who, are you the guy who taps the manager on the shoulder and says, I think you have a little problem in your, or do you let it go? It depends. It depends on my motivation. If, if I want to, if I want to try to help them out, like if I see something going on with a guest, like a, I guess just stole a bottle off the bar or something like that. Then yeah, I'll grab it. And say, hey, that, that, you might want to check that backpack on the way out. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's I want to respect what the the show is. I'm not going to generally pull people aside, uh, and I want to give them. I want to give people a chance, a second and third chance to to make things right. Uh, you know, we just went to a to a place in the last two weeks. The one experience was totally different than the other experience. So somewhere, somewhere between the two, the truth lies, right? And so, so give people some chances to, to make it right. And if they don't, um, like I say, vote with your dollars. Yeah. We have Anne with her hand up. So go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Um, well, it's a little bit more of a, a comment. First of all, hi, Uncle Eddie. I don't think we've talked in like 10 years. <laughs> Anne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, um, Show me what I, you look like. <laughs> I'm in bed with dogs all over me. I'm in my PJs. It's 10 o'clock here, or almost 11 now. Um, uh, but uh, I love that you've brought up grandpa a, a few times yeah. because I don't know if you know this, but I legally changed my name um, in honor of an inside joke that I had with him because he made such a, a huge impact on me and, and um, how welcoming and, and everything that he made me. I was really shy. So, you know, you were saying how he, mm -hmm. he pulled shy people out of that um so he made a huge impact on on me even to this day so I like that you've you've mentioned him a few times but um so my job is actually to make sure that uh all of the employees in my company are happy so they're kind of my my customer and I'm you know doing hospitality for them with you know those little personal personal things and I shouting out people for their birthdays and all of that so I'm really excited I just ordered your book I'm excited to read uh, it and maybe talk to you a little bit more um, about you, all Anne. your experiences that's awesome how are you doing I'm good, good I'm, I'm working glad. from home so I've just been sitting in my house for two years now <laughs> all right so when you were I'm curious about that uh that job, I, I always wanted to be the director of happiness. I wanted that to be on my card. But what it, what do you think is the most uh, the the biggest bang for your buck when you're trying to deliver that to an employee? It's really hard. We have a lot of very specific struggles. Um, where we have over 800 employees spread out all over the world. I've never met most of them because you know some people are in Germany, California, all over. Um, and they, a lot of them work on military bases. So they have a very different culture than, you know, we experience, um, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely hard. Um, we, we send them a lot of little gifts. Like, um, we always send like a Thanksgiving pie to every employee. We send, you know, Christmas gifts. Um, everyone gets a treat for their birthday. We, we love, you know, public recognition for our employees. So it's just those like tiny little things that we're hoping are gonna add up. <laughs> but we're obviously constantly trying to find, you know, 
more ways of of making people happy because like Eddie said, you know, happy employees are going to that's going to affect your your customers as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And we're getting close to ending and um, your uncle ends his book with that reminder of of kindness and um, we're just emerging from this harsh kind of rude place so those simple acts of kindness that you end with in the book and you actually have a a toast that you might even want to share with us tonight. (laughs) Do I know? (laughs) You say um, simple acts of kindness that you can offer anyone that costs you nothing and then you have a toast at the end. But wait, before you read that or share it, if you don't, you might probably don't have to read it, right? It's on the tip of your tongue. Um, Brenda said, Eddie is the epitome of warmth. And I think he's proven that tonight. She says, my husband and I have some wonderful experiences over the years. We even got him on stage with Patti LaBelle, which was great. True. He always shines. <laughs> they, have, they have a video of me doing uh, Lady Mama Lod uh, right next to her. <laughs> yes um so are you talking about the uh the the toast uh the hawaiian toast the one i did in the the, the luau here hang on a minute the lying one no it's at the very end wait a minute do you have not the book end page 129 Thank you. <laughs> Somebody's calling out. <laughs> 129, right? Yep. <laughs> Look at you guys. You guys know my book so much better than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the lying one. Here, all right. So the okay. toast. So here's the setting, right? I'm, 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 I'm staying at a friend's house. He's got this beautiful house right on the beach. He, we buried a pig in the ground. It was like this great luau. We have these beautiful people there and I mean beautiful in spirit you know and and so one of the gals she she flew on airlines and she's she's um she says let me do the toast so she stands up and has a raises a glass and says here's to lying cheating and stealing and stealing lying to save a friend cheating death and stealing someone's heart yeah (laughs) I liked it I love a good turn of phrase yeah. <laughs> and I love being reminded that we need to all be kind and smile and that it really starts with that. Good hospitality starts with looking around you and seeing who needs what and how can I bring a smile to their face. Mm-hmm. It's You're really here. been a joy to have read your book and to, sh- to meet your lovely friends and family on the call to have everyone enjoy this as much as as they have and to see its relevance beyond just dining or uh, customer service, how it just can enrich you personally. So thank you. All right. Thank you, you, everybody, for coming. You're here, Eddie. Good job. Thank you. Thank you you very much. Hey, Ann, reach out to me, okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. Everybody, reach out to me. Okay. See you soon, Eddie. You want me to? Right. I can type. Hi, Brenda. Happy late birthday. Email. Thank you. Give me your email, and Bye. I'll type it in here. It's it's easy. It's it's Eddie it. at eddieheinz.com. So easy. Just go on my <laughs> website right there. Perfect. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Right. Thanks, Bye. Karen. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye, everybody. Aloha. Bye. Bye, Eddie. I always hate ending the meeting before everyone's gone. It just seems rude. <laughs> I know. Aww. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, Brenda. Bye, Bye Eddie. See you Thursday. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lorenza. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate your comment. All right. Well, thank you for doing this, Karen. This is pretty. Oh, awesome. my pleasure. It really was a joy to read the book. Um, uh, thank you. I've had a, our first family wedding. Uh,
I started it before that and I finished it this weekend at a family uh, wedding, 140 people, no wow. COVID protocol. So we'll see how that goes. Yipes, yipes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well thank you i hope uh it sells off the shelf i think it will i hope so too and i'll it's see you gonna in the be a slow burn I, i'm patient i'm a patient man though there you go all right thank Take you care. good right. night good, good night, night.